Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Notre Dame women's basketball coach Muffet McGraw is leaving a legacy on and off the court. In 32 seasons in South Bend, Muffet has led the Fighting Irish to two national championships, seven trips to the title game, and nine appearances in the Final Four. But it was her call for gender equity during this year's tournament that caught the attention of the country and sparked an important conversation on women in leadership. I'm getting tired of the novelty of the first female governor of this state the first female African-American mayor of this city. When is it going to become the norm instead of the exception? We don't have enough visible women leaders. We don't have enough women in power. And when these girls are coming out, who are they looking up to to tell them that that's not the way it has to be? And where better to do that than in sports? All these millions of girls that play sports across the country, they could come out every day, and we're teaching them great things about life skills, but wouldn't it be great if we could teach them to watch how women lead. Today, we talk about the importance of visibility, why she decided to use her platform to speak up, and the lessons she has learned throughout her Hall of Fame coaching career. Here's my conversation with Coach Muffet McGraw. All right, Coach, so let's get right into it. You know, your comments on the need for women in leadership went viral during the Final Four. And so I wanted to ask you, what what message did you really want to get across there? You know, I I was starting small. I think that I was looking in my little corner of the world with basketball and I'm in the women's basketball game. And yet there's still so many men, uh, about 60 40 maybe men to women coaches Mm -hmm. and you look at men's basketball, you look at any other sport really in in the men's side and and it's all male. And so I just started wondering why there's so many men in women's basketball and why aren't there more women? Sure. So were you sort of reacting to a question or did you, did you want to use that stage, you know, of the final four, of course, to make a heck of a point? You know, I was reacting to the question. I, I had done an article, probably came out maybe a week or two before that, and someone asked me about my all-female staff. And I said, I love I love having all women. I never did it before. And <laughs> it was a great change. I was really pleased with, with it. But I decided when it came out, I wanted people to know that it wasn't just happenstance. It didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't an accident. I really feel it's important that we hire women. And I wanted to make that kind of known that you have a choice as a women's head coach, uh, as a female head coach, you have a choice of who you're hiring on your staff. You don't always have that choice because the athletic director is making the decision on the head coach, but you can decide to have an all-female staff. So I wanted to let people know this is a conscious decision to do this. Mm-hmm. Very intentional. You've talked about how you, you don't plan to hire, that you won't hire another male coach. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of why you sort of make that statement and are you confident that you'll stick by that moving forward. I mean, you're a kind of person that doesn't say things that you don't finish, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've hired quite a few men. I've had men on my staff in the past. I have I have a video coordinator. I've got a strength coach. I've got a sports sure. information director. I have a lot of men uh, that are, you know, on our support staff. But in terms of the coaching, I just feel it's so important that we are coaching young women. We're trying to make them strong, independent, confident, empowered women. And how better to do that than to look up and see all females on the staff. I think it sends a great message, and I think it's important to know that a lot of times people look at the guy on the staff and assume, well, he must be the one that's doing the X's and O's. You know, he's doing the offense. He's doing the defense. He's doing the recruiting. He's doing the important things, and the women, you know, we're just figureheads sitting on the bench. So I wanted to get rid of that and to let him know that, you know, the women on my bench, they are doing great things in recruiting and scouting uh, in the X's and O's in every really facet of the game. So I wanted to get away from that stereotype and make sure everybody knew that we could be pretty successful with all women. Sure. Well, you certainly have been. There's no question about that. Tell me this, when you think about your staff, and and you said you have men that are sort of circling around your coaching staff, certainly supporting the program in incredible ways. 
Tell me why you believe that that having visible women to your student athletes, to your kids, is such a critical part of creating change. Because you want to create some change. It's evident in, in what you're speaking out about. Well, you know, I think you can say all you want. You can talk to your daughters and tell them you can be anything you want to be. But unless they actually see it, how are they ever going to believe it? And if they don't see the path that they can take, if they don't see people in that job that you're telling them you can get, you know, how are we ever going to change it? And if you continue to to tell them this is where you can be, but they look up and what do they see? They see a guy coaching their eight-year-old soccer team. They, they see guys coaching them in grade school and then they go on to high school and it's always men. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I think it's, a lot of this starts in Hollywood because, you know, you're going to movies, you're watching shows, you're always watching things and the way they portray women the way the men is uh, men are usually the leading guy. He's usually the star. The women they're not making as much money. You know, <laughs> there's so many things they're not being directed and produced and written by women. Um, you know, I was just looking the other day for some book to my for my team to read, and I thought I put in women authors uh, about teamwork, and I got half of them were were men. And I thought Google, you do not understand me. <laughs> I'm looking for women and ways to. Uh, to continue to teach that to my girls. Well, Coach, you're about to get a stack of books in the mail for me then. Good. <laughs> of mine on how to teach young women to be fearless. So count on that. So let's go back to the beginning of, the, of your career. You, you built this program 32 years ago. Was there anyone at the time that you could look to to aspire to be? Well, certainly Pat Summit. She was somebody that was an icon in our game. Right. She was she, you know, she just did so many things for the women's game. It was never about Tennessee. It was always about what's good for the game. But that was the problem when I was coming out and I was in, you know, in high school looking to what am I going to do next and go to college and who are, who are my role models? And, you know, for me, it was watching the NBA guys. If I'm going to be a good player, I've got to watch somebody. And it was always men. There weren't any women pro leagues back then. And then I, I got into coaching and my mentor, Jim Foster, at St. Joe's in Philly, he was somebody I looked up to. And I kept thinking, like, I keep looking up to these men who who are doing good things, but where are the women? You know, where are all the women that I can look up to? Because I never really had a, a mentor or a role model that was a woman. And I looked at Pat Summit from afar, and, you know, I think as we all did, and sure. and strive to be more like her. She a, was a, an amazing woman, no question. It's really cool because you you're coaching 18 and and 19 and 20 you know year old young women and a lot of basketball coaches just worry about preparing their kids for the next game and it's clear that that you want to have a conversation and help prepare them for life. Tell me a little bit about what that looks like for you in your locker room and in life. Your girls love you. Tell me a little bit about the way you prepare them for life, not just for the next game. Well, I think sports teaches women great things. They're going to learn so many terrific life skills about how to handle adversity, about sacrifice, about discipline, teamwork. Um, And I think there's so many things that it teaches you just from playing the game because you go through so much as an athlete. You know, if you have an injury or, or something goes wrong, you have to figure out how you're going to handle that. And so I think it's really important that we are educators. We're not just coaches, we're educators. So we're trying to teach them these life skills. But in addition to that, we do a lot of things. Um, you know, I quiz them sometimes. I go, all right, get on the baseline. Now, before you run, if you answer this question correctly, you're going to get out of running. Who was the first woman in the Supreme Court? You know, or who was the oh, first that's woman awesome. to do that? And so I'm kind of trying to teach them those things. And anytime a powerful woman comes to campus, I I see if they can stop by. We had Condoleezza Rice stop by um, a couple of weeks ago. We had Ann Thompson from NBC stop by and talk to the team. Uh, You know, we've had some some women. uh, We had the number two woman at NASA. Wow. Who actually was a Notre Dame grad. Stop by. So anytime there's a woman on campus in any capacity, I want my girls to be able to see that this is this is what's out there because they really you don't learn about it in history. You know, we, we have to have Women's History Month and Black History Month <laughs> so we can learn about things we never were taught in school. And so I think it's important to have that sort of education. But also, you know, it's important to let them use their voice and build confidence. So we collaborate a lot. You know, I ask them a lot of questions during practice, you know, what did you think about this? How are we guarding this? Uh, you know, we're going zone, we're going man. You know, what do you think? What's your opinion? And I think especially with this generation, it's important to get their opinion. Oh, no question. Engage them. And some women have a hard time speaking out. And and even women in leadership roles, at, at what point did you feel a responsibility to speak out and comfortable doing it? 
you know, we're socialized as women to be nice and to not not make waves. We always <laughs> are looking to compromise. It's always the woman's job to compromise. When I came to Notre Dame, Title IX was not particularly well enforced. Uh, the men pretty much did what they wanted. And we followed. Uh, they traveled in planes. We bussed. You know, they they stayed in different places. So I think initially I just was kind of taking it all in and thinking, you know, I'm not going to complain about everything. I think you do have to choose your moment, sort of mm-hmm. like being a parent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you can't fight every battle. You got to pick your battles. Um, and I think with women, a lot of times we wait. You know, we wait. When I'm successful, that's when I have the right to speak up. And I don't know when it hit me, but I started thinking, well, that's not a great message to send to my team if I'm going to wait until I'm successful and tell them that's the only way you can speak up. So I think we, you know, we hit a point and I, and I went into uh, to HR to some of the people and said, you know, I, I don't think this is right. Uh, and I wasn't fighting for me so much as for my players, you know, how we travel, when we practice, uh, assistant coaches, their salaries, um, you know, things like that. And then things started to change, but I still was not ready to get up on the soapbox uh, in the middle of campus and do that. I think that did take a, a little bit of time. And uh, and certainly I feel like now uh, I'm at an age where, you know, time's up has been a great thing for women <laughs> to come out. And it's just, it, I mean, it, it just, we've all gotten to that point where sometimes it's not the big things in life. You know, it's those little, little things that just you're constantly banging your head against the wall. You've had to to learn how to negotiate, and and I'm not just talking about money, but things like resources and time. I I would imagine you've had to learn how to navigate those kinds of conversations over the years, and and certainly, like you said, resources. How did you learn to navigate those conversations? And because obviously, negotiation to me, I believe, isn't just about money. It's about your energy. It's about your time. It's about your resources. All those things. When did you start to know your value and have the confidence to ask for what you want? You know, that t- that does take a lot of time. And, and I think it started by I never asked for anything for myself. And so that was mm. that made it a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. I was always wondering, you know, why aren't my assistant coaches' salaries higher? Um, what, you know, why isn't the budget bigger? We're doing the same thing as the men. Uh, I think for women, it's, it's really that's a very tough thing to do. I saw in uh, – a, a little article on uh, Brie Larson after she did her movie and she talked about how she went in and asked for more money and how important it was for her to do that. And I think, you know, we have to look up to people like that who are who are trying to set a new standard for women because we do tend to sit back and wait for somebody to, to recognize how good we are and to just give us what we know we deserve, but we haven't asked for it. And I think in that way, we need to be more like men. We need to be able to go in and sit down. And fortunately, my personality is one where I don't mind confrontation. Mm-hmm. I try to teach my team that confrontation is good. Conflict is good. You you have to grow by getting out of your comfort zone. Right. But that initial meeting, uh, it does. It takes some time. And I probably, I've always been one that I would never go in with ultimatums uh, because mm-hmm. I'd be afraid <laughs> they'd say, well, yeah, well, why don't you go somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> they never say that now, girl. They never say that now. Did you find that as you did it more, you got better at it and more comfortable asking? Absolutely. Uh, I don't know how many times uh, I've talked to so many younger coaches and, and players and, and they'd say, well, I don't know. And I'd say, you can't let that stop you. You know, you can't let that. And I always say, you think a man would do that? And really <laughs> think about that because they, they would not. So mm-hmm. trying to give them the confidence to go in and, and ask for what they want. In just a minute, we'll get back to the episode. But first, here's a free resource I want to share with you. How many of you are leaving money on the table because of costly negotiation mistakes? Getting the best possible outcome in a negotiation can be a challenge. Most people leave money on the table because they don't know how to navigate the conversation. We get it, and we're here to help. Go to 5negotiationmistakes.com to download our free PDF, 5 Negotiation Mistakes Costing You Money. In this free resource, you will learn how to avoid common mistakes. You discover things like how to identify and adapt to different style negotiators, how to maximize your deal points, how to ask with confidence. Once you read this PDF, you'll no longer feel frustrated and overwhelmed when it's time to negotiate. So here's all you need to do next. Download five negotiation mistakes costing you money. Check it out, read it, review it, and start negotiating like a pro. All you have to do is go to fivenegotiationmistakes.com for the free download. 
That's five, like the number five, negotiationmistakes.com. Now back to the conversation. I just want to ask you some leadership questions. What advice do you have for women who are in leadership roles inside of organizations? I mean, you're an incredible leader. You know that what's difficult? Uh, women are looked at differently. The perception of how women lead, I think we're, we're not like men. Uh, I think that sometimes we are expected to be a lot more compassionate. All those things that they always said girls are, you know, sweet and nice and, you know, made of sugar and spice and all that. And, you know, we're not supposed to be competitive and driven and ambitious and, and we are. And so I think it's, it's tough to figure out, you know, when you're in a lot of times a room full of men and you're the one leading them, you know, how we're going to go about this because women are natural collaborators, but men will take advantage of that. And so I, I think that it's, it's difficult to, uh, to navigate that, you really have to go in with a um, you know great vision. You have to have your plan. This is where we're going, and this is how we're going to get there. And certainly, um, I think women are better listeners, and we're more open to that collaborative environment. And I think that it would be great if men would have more women on their team. They would get that, and they would see that environment. Uh, but I think you have to be strong, and you have to know. Um, People are going to probably call you names and say things about you that they would never say about a man who's doing the exact same thing that you are. Um, so you have to have a really tough skin. Um, but I think the vision and the plan are really key. How have you learned to drown out that noise, right? It's just noise that's behind you that, that, that happens, to your point. How have you learned to drown that out? I have an easy time drowning that out. I really do. I feel like the people that I respect, I listen to, and the people that I don't know or, or they don't know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't listen to as much. I don't go looking for it. I don't, I don't turn on Twitter notifications and <laughs> read everything everybody has said. I don't read articles. I, I you know, I, I just, I pretty much just go my own way. Yeah. And uh, the things I need to know, I know. If you had to sort of sum up your leadership philosophy, how, how would you describe your leadership philosophy? I think it's definitely collaboration. I have a great staff, and when I hire. I always try to hire people that are different than me that are going to complement my skills and everybody in the room together. We're going to have everything we need individually. We're not going to be all the same. I always look for people that are going to challenge uh, things. I always say we throw out a game plan and then I want you to poke some holes in it. Tell me how it's not going to work. Mm. I don't want to be surrounded by people that are going to agree with me all the time. Uh, I don't think that's really healthy. So I think it's important that, um, that you have that kind of attitude. And, and I think the flexibility, being willing to change, seeing that, yeah, I think you're right. That's not working. Being able to see another point of view because you tend to have your own way of doing things and, you know, you feel good about this, the way we're going and you have to step back and really take it in, think about it, listen to it. And, you know, sometimes go in a direction you'd never thought you'd go in, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but you got to be willing to fail. And that is, that is so key. You've got to be able to fail. Sure. Failure is an awesome thing, isn't it? can be. We learn a ton. Yep. Yeah, it can be if you learn from it. No question. What are some of the things you do maybe weekly or even daily as a leader to create that connectivity with your staff and your kids? Well, we, we, we do it every day here because we meet every day to plan our practices and our games and uh, our strategies. So it's it's kind of a constant thing. But even when I meet with the support staff and we're talking about events we're going to have or something that's that's coming down the road and somebody says, oh, why don't we try this? You know, and I'm like, let's go around the room and let's go around everybody mm-hmm. quick, you know, quick thoughts on, you know, pros and cons and and see how it looks, because, you know, sometimes you, you have a just a different way of looking at things that somebody else comes from a completely different perspective. So I think that that feedback is really important. Do you have any rituals or routines that you deploy in practice that you think helps your kids stay so connected and gelled and your staff to stay connected to them? Yeah, you know, I, I think that I, I like to ask questions during practice, mm-hmm. you know, when things don't go well, like we're saying, like, here's what we're doing. And then it doesn't go well. And instead of just telling them what they did wrong and constantly being on them, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. You know, it kind of sounds like you're not doing it my way. And so I always ask them, you know, what do you think you could have done in that situation? You know, if this comes up, what do you think? There's, you know, this much time left. What What are you thinking? Did you see this? You know, she was maybe a little more open. Um, you know, it's always more geared to basketball, of course, but it gets them thinking. And I think when they have the confidence to answer those questions, 
that's going to help empower them. Which shows that, though, you've created an incredibly safe environment with a ton of trust for them to feel like they can react to those questions honestly. Absolutely. That, that is definitely key. I mean, the freshmen are not going to be speaking up quite as, uh, <laughs> quite as much as the seniors would be. And I think that's true. And team, you have young, you know, people are just starting out. They're going to they're going to probably listen a little bit more than talk. How much are you driven by fear of failure? And you've talked a little bit about this versus a desire for success. I definitely hate to lose more than I like to win. (laughs) Uh, Fear of failure, I think, definitely is something that that is always there because people say, why do you still get nervous before games? You know, you've been doing this for so long. You've had some success. And I just, you know, I I just want it to be perfect and I don't want to make any mistakes. And so I think that drive is what keeps me going. And uh, I'm always going to be nervous before the game because I can think of all the things that could go wrong. Uh, so it helps me prepare a little bit harder. How do you handle losses personally and professionally when, you know, as a team and, and as an individual? I wish I didn't have as much practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have much, you know, let's be honest. <laughs> you know, earlier in my career, boy, I would hold on to it. I would hold on okay. to losses so long. And, you know, you look at the film and, and you, you know, you say these, these are the reasons we lost. And it, it just really, I, I just couldn't let it go. And I think I became a much better leader when I could just let it go and say, okay, we, that one didn't come out like we wanted to. Here's what we learned from it. And sometimes I'll go around the room and ask every player, what did you learn from that loss? Because if you don't learn from it, then it's, it's pointless. If you can lose a game and say, it's going to make us better. You know, we've had situations where we've lost games and they did. They made us better. They got us ready for the next one. And, you know, we went on to have more success. It's it's tough when you lose that last one, when you can't, you know, you can't get that back. That one's a little tougher and that stays with me a little bit longer. But uh, like, you know, I said before, failure is good. It's going to teach you a lot about yourself. It's going to teach you a lot about your team. And you got to you got to learn those lessons. But it sounds like you really lean into those moments and get clear on what didn't work, why didn't it work, how can we roll it up and apply it to the next game, the next moment, the next opportunity? I have to know right away. I mean, I, I've got to watch that game immediately and see. And first I look at what did I do wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, I think a lot of coaches are like, well, we didn't, you, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Uh, I look at myself first and I say, what, what, you know, what could I have done differently, whether it's different players, different defenses, different offense, you know, there's so many things. And then when you see, oh, I, you know, I made a couple of mistakes too. It's a little easier to look at your team and say, you know, okay, I understand. Um, but, and it's good to hear from them and let them, let them have a chance to let you know they were not happy with that either. Uh, Cause I think sometimes you think, oh, I just, I took it worse than they did. I care more than they do. Um, and this is, that's not true. Do you have a system? Like, do you capture those thoughts after those moments so that you can lean back at that and really ensure that you're capturing all those moments that you've learned from? Yeah, I, I, I try to write things down afterwards and say, the, you know, these are the things that, because if I don't fix it right away, then I feel like it. I've got to be able to do that to move on. So I'll, I'll write things down and say, these are the things, this is what I got to get better at. Uh, here's some things I can work on, we'll work on. And then we immediately get to work. Like the next day, we're like, we're working on this right now so we can fix it. Do you meet with your staff one-on-one or as a group to sort of break down what happened? We meet as a group. Yep. Um, and yeah, we always do it in a group. And accountability is something I think is a really important trait for all of us to have. And so that's always great because I divide my team up into, you know, my one assistant does post players, wings, guards. So you know, they have kind of areas of responsibility so they can come in and look immediately and say, here's what my group needs to do better. You've alluded in some interviews to to running on stress as a coach. You talk about it. But I'm watching your team play and they play with such joy and they feel uh, and look relaxed. How, how do you do that? Right. Because you've talked about how you sort of lock yourself in your office and yeah. <laughs> and are super stressed out before the games. But it, your athletes seem pretty calm and locked in and, and really ready to go. How do you do that? Well, mostly I stay away from them on game day. That's, that's <laughs> the one key. Um, and they know, they know that that's just me. Okay. I'm just, I'm going to be that way. But you know, once the game starts, I always feel a lot better, but this generation in particular, I think, you know, they've got their music, they've got things that they do to relax. And this group that I just had was very, very relaxed and free. And I think the way we play allows for them to be creative, allows for them to make mistakes and, and kind of be free to play their game which is important, but, um, I think it's a, it's a little bit of personality, you know, each, each team is different and some teams are more, more serious and I want them to be themselves. I don't want them to come in and say, no, this is what we do pregame. 
no, we're, we're going to let you do whatever you want pregame. You listen to whatever you want. You put your earphones in and you're, you're on your own getting ready. And as long as you can get ready for the game, I'm going to allow you to do whatever you want. Mm. So you trust their process, their system pregame. Yes. That's cool. Yes. So just some recruiting, obviously you've got to get inside of a lot of living rooms and a lot of gyms to bring in the kind of kids you want to, want to coach. What's your approach? You know, it's interesting. I, I look for red flags now. I used to look at kids and it was all about talent. Yeah, they're good. Let's get them. Um, mm-hmm. Let's mm-hmm. offer them. Mm-hmm. And then they'd come in and I'd think, boy, they, you know, they don't, that's not a great fit for us. So now it's, to me, it's all about the chemistry of the team, uh, how they get along. So I want kids that are unselfish, number one, that work hard, that compete. Uh, those are things I don't think you can teach. Um, basketball part, you can teach a lot, of, a lot of things with that. But I want somebody that wants to win more than they want to score a lot of points. And so I watch them during the game. I watch how hard they work. Uh, I watch, are they diving for loose balls? Are they looking up into the stands for their parents? Are they listening to what the parents are saying? I like to see the ref make a few bad calls against them. I like to see the coach yell at them. I like to see them lose so I can see how competitive they are. And I look for a lot of those, those type of things. And then I look at how does the team look at them? Are they a leader? Are they somebody who, you know, maybe they're, they have the ball a lot, you know, are they sharing the ball? If they give it up to their teammate and and they miss a shot, you know, how are they encouraging them? You know, what is their leadership potential? Because I think having leaders is really important. So I want to see the relationship that they all have. And I want to see, you know, when I talk to them, you know, about are they blaming the refs? Are they blaming the coach? Are they blaming someone else? Because I don't want that in my program. I want to enjoy the four years I'm going to have them. And so I think all those things are so important. Yeah, I'm sure your approach, as you alluded to, has changed over the years. And and parents I have seen as a mother of teenage daughters who all play sports have changed <laughs> significantly over the years. What advice do you have for parents of young athletes that are listening? Well, the, my, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is very simple. Let your kids fail. Mm-hmm. The problem that we have now as parents is that we want to fix everything for our kids. They go into a situation where maybe they're not the number one player on the team. Uh, you know, maybe they're, they're playing a different role. And I think that the kids need to learn they're not always going to be the star. They're not always going to be the one. And what's happening now is when things don't work, the mom or dad are right down there talking to the coach. Uh, they're at the school talking to the teacher. They're talking to the principal. They're talking to, you know, another kid's um, parents because they don't like the way the, you know, the play date is going. Uh, <laughs> I think that they just step in and try to fix everything. And they're not learning any skills, so they don't know how to handle adversity. So then when they get to this level in college, uh, even if they're not an athlete, they're, you know, they're in the dorm, they're living with other kids. They don't know how to handle little conflicts or little problems that come up um, because they, they have no mental toughness. They've never had to really fight their way out of a situation. And so for the first time they get to college, somebody's saying, no, that's not, that's not the way we do it here. Or you got hurt. You're going to miss this whole year. You know, something bad is going to happen. And what happens now the parents are saying, you know what, we're going somewhere else. We're going to change high schools. We're going to change AAU teams. We're going to change colleges because it can't be you. It can't be you. Right. You're special. <laughs> uh, it's got to be the coach. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the issue we're facing. And, and I worry about the, the next generation of leaders wh- who can't handle adversity. Well, I tell you, I was a student athlete at Michigan State and played tennis. And I see, you know, my mom after matches or I'd split sets. I mean, she had no idea. I'd come off at the split and she'd go, Mom, you know, do you want a banana, honey? Do you need a little salt <laughs> in your water? You know, and I'm like, Mom, do you think I need to play her backhand? She's like, I don't know, honey. I think you're doing great. <laughs> And you look great in your uniform. I'm so proud of you. Right. I mean, and it was such a wonderful thing, though. Yeah. And it's so different today. Yeah. And candidly, it breaks my heart because I think sports is such an incredible platform for young women. Right. All the lessons that it can teach, no matter what level you end up at. It, it right. doesn't matter. You learn so much from just waking up every day and going and grinding it. Yep. It's such a powerful thing. I saw an article where when the, they asked a, a lot of athletes, like, who – who do you like to come to the games? And like, who would you ride home with basically right, after the game? Right. And they always say the grandparents because, you know, they get no coaching. They get no blaming. They get nothing but love. Well, I, I, I've heard a statistic that's staggering that, that one of the biggest reasons kids quit sports is the ride home. Yep. yep. If it's not with grandma and grandpa, that is maybe. Yeah. You know, you're a mother, of course, and a wife. 
we have a lot of working parents listening. How have you juggled and what advice do you have for people that, that are working and navigating parenting at the same time? Find a great partner. Uh, I think that's so key. You have to have, it has to be a partnership. It has to be somebody that you can lean on that's going to take over a lot of the responsibilities that, you know, typically women have most of the roles of, you know, taking care of the laundry and doing the cooking and, you know, getting the kids all settled. And, and I've noticed a lot of, a lot of times, um, sometimes fathers will step in and do things and the mom is thanking them for, oh, thanks for changing diapers and for taking the kids off here and there. And, you know, with us, it was like, no, that's your job. <laughs> that's, that's your job as much as it's my job. And we are going to be team. We are going to be team McGraw all the way. And I have had the most incredible spouse. Uh, he's been terrific in every single way and has helped me. But I think it was great for my son to learn first that women are strong and capable and independent and confident because uh, he grew up around all my teams. And it's, so it's great for him to have that respect for women and to understand that. And And he's a good husband. He's And he does a lot of the cooking <laughs> and he does a lot of the other things. So I think I've raised a feminist and I'm very proud of that. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. You know, I have to sort of touch on the fact that you have five players that have just been selected into the WNBA draft, which is absolutely incredible. What transformation do you want those girls to have as they leave Notre Dame and, and you and, and the staff and the influence that's been wonderful that they've had with you and, and go on to the next level? What does that look like in your head and, and, and really in your heart for those kids? I want them to go into the, a new community and be a force in the community. I want them to be visible in the community. I want them to have a voice and to get out and appreciate all of the things that they've been given and to give back in some other way. Uh, I think they're role models. They have to be on all the time. They have to be doing things the right way. They're going to be interviewed. They're going to be out uh, doing things in the community. And, and so people are going to look up to them and they need to embrace that role and have young kids, you know, looking up to them. So mm -hmm. um, I'm excited about the way they represent us, the way they'll represent Notre Dame. And I know that they're going to be great representatives of our program. What's been harder for you? You know, you building a championship culture, which you've done at Notre Dame or sustaining it? I think sustaining it, we've been pretty good. And, you know, last year's national championship, trying to get back and win it again this year was hard. That was really hard because expectations can really weigh you down. Uh, they can just weigh on you mentally, physically. You get a little more tired. Um, you win games and you're not celebrating. You're relieved. You did what you were supposed to do. There's nowhere to go but down mm -hmm. when you're ranked number mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot tougher. Uh, a lot of respect for Connecticut and Gino and what they've been able to maintain, uh, you know, over so many years because it is it is really difficult. And I think we're coming into a time now where parity is really big. Uh, we're, we're getting there now in women's basketball where more teams have more good players and more WNBA players. And, you know, it was historic. It was exciting for us to have five go, but um, we've got to reload now. So I, I've not <laughs> been in this situation for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm up for the challenge. I have no doubt you'll do it. Tell me this. I mean, when you think and you look back at the teams you've coached, what do you think is the difference? I mean, if you can give our, our folks, our leaders, something here with, with regards to good teams and great teams? Because it's one thing to be a good team, and it's a whole other thing to be a great team. It really is. I think the leadership of your captains, you know, you mm -hmm. have those seniors, mm -hmm. those upperclassmen, and they are the ones, because you're not in the locker room, and that's where a lot of this goes on. So when you have a culture, it's all about the culture. You have to establish this is how we do things here. These are these are the rules. You know, some of them written, some of them unwritten. This is how you behave. This is how you act. Uh, this is what you do. And and we are all in. And everybody understands what those rules are. Everybody knows uh, this is how you know the things that we value. Uh, these are the attributes that we value, and we talk about that all the time. You know, what do you want the media to say about you when they're looking at our team? What kind of values? Do you want them to talk about? And it's all about the culture. I read a great book on that, The Culture Code, and it was really interesting. Absolutely, Daniel Coyle. He's been on the show. That's an incredible book. Great book, yeah. You're recruiting all the time. Well, not all the time, but you're recruiting every single season. And, and you have been able to get such unselfish kids and such unselfish players, but yet they're obviously incredibly talented. Sometimes it's hard to think about those things together. Tell me a little bit about how you've been able to 
to sort of thread that needle. Yeah, you know, it's important. Everybody we have, we've got a lot of All-Americans, high school Americans. We've got a lot of, you know, player of the year kind of people. So I've, I've found it to be pretty easy to get women to buy into the team. It's all about team. It's not about you. It's about the team. It's not about how many points you score. It's whether we win or lose. But the biggest thing I do is before every season, we get in a circle, which we do before every practice. But I go around and I tell them three things that is basically your responsibility. These are the three things I expect you to do every game. You got to bring these three things every practice. These are kind of your your jobs. And so I, I sort of assign them roles and everybody knows, um, you know, she's probably going to shoot more threes than me because she's our best three point shooter. She may score more than me. You know, my job is more defense, more rebounding, more assists. My job is on the bench to be encouraging, to make somebody better at practice. So everybody knows not just what their job is, but what everyone else's mm-hmm. job is. So, mm-hmm. you know, when the parents are in the stands shouting, shoot, them, <laughs> shoot oh. them all. You know, the the team's going, no, it's yep. really not her job to shoot the ball. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, they know and then they, you know, they buy into it or not. And at the end of the year, I meet with them individually. What did you think you did well? What do you want to do more of? You know, how can we expand your role? Um, but it's based on what you're good at. And so at the end of the year, when you do that, Coach, do you does that create an opportunity for you then to hold them accountable to – what they have proclaimed that they want to accomplish moving forward? Absolutely, because it's based on what they talked about the year before. You know, we sat down and they said, you know, these are some things that that I want to do. And I say, well, here's, you know, here's what I think you need to get better at. Um, and usually they're they're almost identical. And so then the next year we said, well, you know, you said you were going to work on this. You didn't really get better at that. Or boy, you did a great job working on this. Now let's, you know, let's move on to something else. So they definitely, I, I think accountability, as I said before, that's, that's really important. Coach, when you look back at your entire career, what do you want people to say about you? Someday I'm going to have a moment and look back on my career. <laughs> uh, I think sometimes when you're in it, you know, you just, mm-hmm, you're in it and mm-hmm. you just like talking about the next game and where do we go from here? Um, so, you know, I, I want people to say we, we did things the right way. We've followed the rules, not just the rules, but the intent of the rules and, and that I empowered these women to go out and to do great things. So you've been so generous with your time. We wrap with a rapid fire section. So I am, and I know you're uh, always ready to go. So I'm going to fire off some questions and you just fire back what comes up. Okay. All right. One word to describe you. Competitive. One word your players would use to describe you. Competitive. <laughs> What's the best part of your job? Seeing the uh, the moment when they're successful. Mm. What's the worst part? What's the most challenging part? That's a better way to say that. I think having the uh, the energy and the time mm-hmm. to really, really kind of gel with, with the team. I think it's hard when there's so many of them. Mm-hmm. Who's a person you'd most like to meet? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What's the biggest misconception you think people have about you? <laughs> <laughs> I think people think I'm tougher than I really am. Uh-huh. Okay. Right. Your son's got all the secrets, I'm sure. Yeah. And your husband. What is success to you? Achieving your potential. So the show is called Game Changers. So one last question. What game changer inspires you and why? I think really any woman who is willing to step up and talk about how we can do more for women. Mm -hmm. I'd say RBG, definitely seeing that movie, seeing Billie Jean King, seeing that movie and what she did for tennis and what Mm -hmm. Ruth Bader Ginsburg has done. Yeah, no, Billie Jean F definitely changed the trajectory of tennis. No question. Muffet, and thank you so much. Thanks for what you do for young women, for young girls as the mother of three, as I told you earlier. I appreciate you. Thanks, Molly. I enjoyed being on. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.